So this isn't going to be a 90-minute lecture. Um, I'm going to give, for the first um, half hour, I'm going to do a sort of interactive introduction to nuclear weapons and nuclear power issues with you, where I'll be asking for your participation. Then we're going to break into two small groups. Um, in other words, we're going to split this group in half, and one group is going to be hearing the testimony of Toshiko Tanaka, and the other group will be hearing the testimony of Reiko Yamada. And because we want all of you to get some sense of their story, we would like to ask that there be students in each group that are willing to give feedback on the session that they heard so that everybody can come away with a little bit of the story of both of these extraordinary, courageous women. So when you break into the small groups, I'm going to come around and I'm going to ask for a recorder and a reporter that when we come back finally in the last part of our time together, that one student from one group can feedback what Reiko said to the whole group, and one student from one group will feedback to Toshi what Toshiko said. And during this last part uh, of our time together, we'd really like to invite your questions and especially your comments. What does it, what's it like for you to hear this firsthand testimony? Um, I'm sure that in the future, if you all choose to have children someday of your own, they will learn about what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And you will be able to say to them, I met a survivor from Hiroshima and this is what she told me. Um, so, how's that sound? Good? Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna ask for your participation in moving to the small groups. We're also gonna ask for your participation in listening and being respectful to one another, and to really sharing your thoughts and your comments and your questions. So I know it's a big group, but um, we're really relying on you for that. So what I'd like to do to begin is just introduce our team because this project takes a lot of effort and um, we're all volunteers. We're dedicated to ridding the world of nuclear weapons and we feel the way the best to do that is for people to hear the firsthand witness of those who survived an actual bombing uh, with nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So I'd like to begin um, by introducing Carolina Soto, who is one of our main team members. For <laughs> and we also are very privileged to have joined us the beautiful filmmakers Kosaku and Rieko. They are live streaming you, and many of the people who will be watching you, and they're very curious about what happens in New York City High Schools, are people from Japan. So that's exciting. Um, and I'd also like to introduce Hideo and Marie, who are our interpreters today. Without them, we wouldn't know what was going on. And finally, and especially, I would like to introduce Reiko Yamada and Toshiko Tanaka, who are the Toshiko and Reiko to give you each a short message. So, um, Dozo, Reiko. Hi, Sam. Hello, 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 Sam. My name is uh, Reiko Yamada. I'm actually from Tokyo, but I was from Hiroshima originally. And 67 years ago, way before your parents were born, I experienced the nuclear bomb devastation. So we would like to share uh, my story today with you. Thank you very much for coming.
Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I feel privileged and honored to be invited to such a lovely school. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
Yeah, a lot of people get the chance to do that. Great. So interacting with other people, being with the people you love. How about one more? Go ahead. Um, being alive is a, it's, it's kind of like a reminder of how there's always a chance for you to explore new things and do things that people who aren't alive couldn't do. Right, so you can do things and make great new ground and explore new opportunities. Yeah. Wonderful, okay, great. Well, the reason you might wonder why we start our session with uh, acknowledging what it is that we love about being alive. And I'm sure that you can appreciate that while it's difficult to oftentimes listen to the stories of the survivors because of what they saw and what they experienced. Imagine how difficult it is to tell those stories. You know, I'm sure you've had the experience of feeling pain about something that's happened in your life or feeling loss, perhaps uh, a loved one has died. When you remember that experience, you can still recall some of the emotions. So it's really what, what the Hivaksha give us is not only the gift of their vision and passion for a nuclear free world, but they risk that vulnerability every time they tell their stories. They're sharing a part of their pain in remembering what they experienced. So we like to start with reminding ourselves of what we love about being alive because we believe that that helps us make the nuclear issue personal to us. You know, a lot of people would say, oh, those bombs, it's the experts, you know, governments, who cares, who knows. Or Fukushima, you know, that's happening over in Japan. And in fact, nuclear weapons and nuclear power really do threaten everything that we love. And when we can connect to it like that, when we think about, you know, our mother's smile or the favorite soup that our grandmother made or, you know, your favorite piece of music or your favorite book that you like to read, that makes it personal. And that's where we can step in and make a difference. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Yes. So when you hear the story of Reiko and Toshiko, Think about what you love and what you want to save in your own personal life. And that will help us bring the story back to our own lives and how we can be a part of making a difference. Okay, so it's um, early in the morning, so we're going to do, even though you're all scrunched in there, a tiny little exercise. It's very simple, and um, it's going to give us an, an idea of the di individual talents and um, opinions in this room and knowledge in this room. Okay, you guys all know how this goes. Um, stand up if you are a Yankees fan. Stand up if you are a Mets fan. Russia? Russia? What else? 
to us. United States in the back. Soviet Union. Right? You said that. Russia. <laughs> Russia. <laughs> Russia. <laughs> Russia. 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 Russia.
is that in order for the scientists to develop nuclear weapons at the what project? Anyone know? Manhattan. The Manhattan Project, which was located in what state in the southwest of the United States? New Mexico. New Mexico. The top secret Manhattan Project <coughs> in New Mexico to develop the weapons used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What was necessary for those weapons was to mine uranium from the earth, refine it in a way that the uranium atom could be split, but also create the world's first nuclear reactor in Hanford, Washington to create plutonium for the <coughs> Nagasaki bomb. Okay, I know that's a lot of stuff that just went on there. Uranium was the Hiroshima bomb. That was the main ingredient for the Hiroshima bomb. Plutonium was the main ingredient for the Nagasaki bomb. Plutonium is created in a nuclear reactor. So at the very beginning of the what project? Manhattan. In which state? Manhattan. They had to create a reactor to create what? Plutonium. Plutonium. Excellent. Okay, so there isn't a chicken and egg argument about this. If you want to create a nuclear bomb, you have to have a nuclear reactor. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that. But the reason that we're talking about that is because of what accident recent, that recently happened in Japan. Uh, Fukushima, an earthquake and a tsunami uh, destroyed the cooling system at a nuclear power complex in northeast Japan and that precipitated a very big radioactive release which is ongoing to this day. And that's what we're concerned about. So we can ask questions about that, but I just wanted to give you a quick uh, idea of how nuclear weapons and nuclear power are, re are related. Does somebody want to summarize that for the whole group? You can do it. No? Anyone? Will you do it later? Will someone do it later? Okay. <laughs> so now, the last thing I'm going to do before we hand over to, before we break into small groups, is I'm going to give a sound demonstration to um, help us imagine the explosive force of nuclear weapons. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Okay, so you're getting a little hot. Okay, so you're, we're going to move it into separate groups in a minute. But just stay with me for one minute. Who said imagination is more important than knowledge? Oh, Albert Einstein. What do you think he meant? Uh, wait, I just because I just answered Okay, <laughs> but just think about it. What, what, what do you think he meant by that? Uh, you have to use your creativity to motivate yourself to find new ideas. Exactly. You use your knowledge to apply it, but your creativity is what moves it. Exactly. So without imagination, knowledge wouldn't exist. Imagination is what propels us to create. And um, so he said, we have to imagine things before they come into existence. So imagination is more important. Having a creative mind is more important than being able to spit out the facts. So sometimes we use our imagination to create things. Sometimes we use our imagination to imagine what would happen in order to not do something. So this imagination exercise um, is going to help us understand the explosive force of the world's nuclear arsenal, those nine countries, those 23,000 nuclear weapons, through using sound. Um, and I'm sorry, we don't have a microphone, so you're just going to have to crane your ears here. But we can, can I have a volunteer, or two volunteers? Will you ladies stand up here? So we're going to hold this higher so that you, so we'll get a little bit of an echo from here. Would you all um, just hold on either side there, and then I'm going to come in front of you. Okay. So this is the first sound that we're going to listen to. It's the sound of one BB dropping into the tin. Um, every time you hear one BB dropping into the tin, for the purpose of our imagination exercise, 
That is going to be the equivalent of the firepower of the Second World War. Every time you hear one BB, that is the explosive force of the Second World War, the firepower. So what do you think that means, firepower? The guns and artillery. So the artillery, and what's coming from the guns that's firepower? Bullets. Bullets. So the whole of the Second World War, do you think that was like 10,000 bullets or? No. Millions and millions of bullets. Okay, what else is in the firepower? Gunpowder. Gunpowder, part of bullets. <coughs> artillery. What are the things that you can take a pin out of and throw? Grenades. Grenades. What about things dropping from planes? Bombs. Bombs. What about the stuff you can step on? And <coughs> okay, and what about the new firepower of the second world war? The atomic bombs that were used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So every time you hear one BB dropping into the tin, it is the equivalent of all the bullets, all the bombs, all the artillery, all the grenades, all the landmines, and the two new nuclear weapons used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And for those of you who are um, science-minded, it's around three megatons of explosive force with each BB that's dropped into the tin. Okay? With me? All right. Now, the second sound that we're going to hear is the equivalent firepower of the world's nuclear arsenal today. It does not include how many bullets we have or how many grenades there are in the world or how many bombs there are. This is the equivalent firepower of the world's nuclear arsenal with each BB equaling one World War II. So in order to more fully engage your imagination, I'd like to ask you to please close your eyes as we listen to the sound that represents the world's nuclear arsenal 67 years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. when they hear that sound? Any comments or feelings or? That was definitely more than one. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, it's roughly 2,225 World War II's equivalent to 23,000 nuclear weapons. And we have the lesson plan post posted on our website so you can see the actual numbers. So, so that's not just something to scare people, that's an actual calculation for the explosive force of the world's nuclear arsenal. But students often do report feeling afraid when they hear that sound. Any other uh, feelings or thoughts that people want to share? Well, I've done that demonstration um, many, many times, and students often report feeling sad and feeling angry and feeling afraid when they hear that sound. And, you know, that sound not only represents explosive force, but that sound also represents resources that are being used to maintain nuclear arsenals and brain power that's being used to use the human mind 
to create weapons for war. And um, I think that there are lots of ways that we could figure that we might <coughs> use such resources and especially use such human um, ingenuity because unfortunately there are many problems in our world but luckily there are a lot of people who care a great deal and who are very very bright and given the right support we can find our way to find more uh, environmentally sustainable energy sources to find more ways to be equitable with our um, resources that we have and to have more peace in our world. That was my introductory lesson. Thank you very much for participating. Um, let's move into two small groups.